The Battle of the Kentish Knock was a naval battle between the fleets of the Dutch Republic and England, fought on 28 September 1652. During the First Anglo-Dutch War near the Shoal called the Kentish Knock in the North Sea about 30 kilometres east of the mouth of the river, Thames. The Dutch fleet, internally divided on political, regional and personal grounds, proved incapable of making a determined effort and was soon forced to withdraw, losing two ships and many casualties. In Dutch the action is called the Slag Bidge der Hoofden. Backgrounds Dutch Lieutenant Admiral Martin Tromp had been suspended by the States General of the Netherlands after his failure to bring the English to battle off the Shetland Islands in August, and replaced as Supreme Commander of the Confederate Dutch fleet by the Hollandic Vice Admiral Whitler with of the Admiralty of the Maze. This caused an immediate rift between the provinces of Holland and Zeeland as De With was the personal enemy of the commander of the Zeelandic fleet. Vice Admiral Johan Evertsen, who himself had quit service because of a conflict with the States General. Earlier tensions had been moderated by the fact that both Trump and Evertsen were staunch Orangists, but De With was a loyal servant of the States regime that had dominated Dutch politics since the death of Stadtholder William II of Orange. De With having for months advocated a more aggressive naval policy aimed at destroying the enemy fleet instead of passively defending the merchant convoys against English attack, now saw an opportunity to concentrate his forces, joining the squadron of Vice Commodore Michiel de Reuter, and gain control of the seas. He set out to attack the English fleet at anchor at the Downs near Dover, departing from the schooner Veld on 25 September 1652. Immediately the fleet was hit by a storm damaging many vessels. De With also had to protect the trade routes and discovered that nine of de Reuter's ships, that had been on sea for two months, had to return to port for repairs. De Reuter suggested that under the circumstances it was better to simply keep luring away the English from merchant fleets while declining to really fight. But De With insisted on delivering a decisive battle, stating, I shall lustily lead the fleet to the enemy, the devil may bring it back again. Battle. When the fleets finally met on 28 September, the United Provinces had 62 ships and about 1,900 cannon and 7,000 men. The Commonwealth of England, 68 ships under General at Sea Robert Blake with about 2,400 cannon and 10,000 men. The van of the Dutch fleet was to be commanded by Michiel de Reuter, the centre by de with himself and the rear by temporary rear Admiral Gideon de Wilde of the Admiralty of Amsterdam. On the morning of 28 September the Dutch fleet, approaching from the east, had the previous evening been again scattered by a gale and was still dispersed when around noon it saw Blake coming out in force from the south. Having the weather gauge because of a south-southwestern breeze, Blake intended to exploit this excellent opportunity for a direct attack on the disordered Dutch. Having hurriedly assembled his force around 1430, with the exception of five vessels that had drifted too far to the north, De With now wanted to transfer his flag from the smaller Princes Louise to the Breeder Road, Trump's former flagship and the most powerful vessel of the Dutch fleet. However, to his mortification, Trump's crew refused to let him on board, addressing De with the invective, green cheese, and even threatening to fire a salvo on his boat if he did not stop waving around his commission. Papers from the States General He had a very bad reputation among common sailors, indeed hundreds had already deserted when it became known he would be supreme commander. Zeelander Commodore Cornelis Evertsen the Elder, the brother of Johan Evertsen, was called in to negotiate but to no avail. When the enemy fleet was within half a mile distance, De With was forced to hoist his flag on the large but slow VOC ship Prince Willem where he found the majority of its officers drunk in the crew to be, consisting of untrained men. Action was joined at about 1700 when Blake, himself moving his flag from the too large sovereign to the more maneuverable resolution, engaged the Dutch. 
Blake intended to break the Dutch line, but on the approach of the English fleet the mass of Dutch ships began to give way to the east. At the same time the wind slackened considerably. As a result, both fleets slowly passed each other in opposite tack. This was very unfavorable for the Dutch, normally being in a leeward position would have given him a longer range. But with such gentle winds this advantage was absent while the English ships were larger and better armed than their opponents, inflicting severe damage. Nevertheless, some English ships at first got into trouble. The Sovereign and James ran aground on the Kentish Knock sandbank and only with much difficulty worked themselves free. The Resolution and the Dolphin, venturing too far forward, became isolated and surrounded but were saved by the encroachment by the other English vessels. The Prince Willem was disabled, meaning that De With was greatly hampered in his efforts to lead his forces. But soon, by 1900, the fighting stopped due to the onset of darkness, the fleets just having finished this single maneuver. At this moment one Dutch ship, the Maria, had been captured while another captured ship, the Gorkum, was abandoned by the English in a sinking condition but reoccupied and saved by the Dutch. The borough of Van Alkmaar blew up. Several Dutch ships, their morale shaken by the devastating English fire, left their formation. The next day, early in the morning, about ten Dutch ships, mostly commanded by captains from Zeeland who resented the domination of Holland and severely disliked De With, had broken off the engagement and simply sailed home. This is usually attributed to the fact that De With in the battle council in the morning of the second day had called all Zeeland captains cowards, and had warned them that in Holland there was still sufficient wood left to erect gallows for any of them. The situation had become hopeless for the Dutch who now had 49 ships left in the fleet while the English fleet had during the night been reinforced. To 84, yet De With still wanted to make a last effort. On his directions the Dutch fleet, now positioned to the southeast of the English force, sailed farther south in the hope of gaining the weather gauge. This design failed however. First some ships, with difficulty beating up the wind, coursed too far to the west and were badly mauled by the fire of the English rear, and hardly had the Dutch fleet moved to its intended position when, it all proved to have been in vain because the wind turned to the northeast giving the English the weather gauge again. Michiel de Reuter and Cornelis Evertsen now managed to convince De With to accept the inevitable and the Dutch fleet late in the afternoon withdrew, to the east followed by Blake, as De With angrily described it, like a herd of sheep fleeing the wolves. Assisted by a westerly De With and De Reuter nicely covered the retreat with a dozen ships and the Dutch would not lose any more vessels. The English fleet halted its pursuit when the Flemish shoals were reached. De With now decided to quickly repair the fleet at sea in the Wheelingen Basin and then make another attempt at defeating the enemy. This order was met with utter disbelief by his fellow flag officers. De Reuter tactfully pointed out, Such courage is too perilous. Understanding he was alone in his opinion De With at last agreed to withdraw the fleet to Hellefitzhaus, where it arrived on 2 October. Aftermath, the Dutch recognized after their defeat that they needed larger ships to take on the English, and instituted a major building program that never really came to pass until the Second Anglo-Dutch War. According to De With this, besides a lack of a sufficient number of fire ships, had been the main cause of the Dutch failure. He pointed out that many a light English frigate could outshoot the average Dutch warship. However, according to public opinion there was only one to blame for the defeat, though with himself. As one of the more polite pamphlets puts it, a week after the battle, from this disorder and unwillingness to fight it can be seen and noticed what difference it makes whether one has or appoints a head of a fleet who is judicious polite and popular, or whether one imposes on the men ahead who is unloved, despised by the men and unsavory to them. Vice Admiral De Witt is, we all know this, an excellent soldier and bold sailor, who fears no danger, nor even death itself. 
Likewise, Commodore de Reuter is an audacious and fearless hero, who would not hesitate to engage the worst of enemies, heeding no danger. Notwithstanding all of this, we also know that Admiral Trump possesses all these same qualities, and besides these uncommon virtues, of being an extraordinary careful, God-fearing and virtuous man who does not call his men dogs, devils, or devil's brood, but children, friends, comrades and similar loving and endearing words to address them with by which he so much endears those serving under him that they, as they say, would go a through fire for him and risk their lives, yes, by manner of speech, would not hesitate to fight the devil, if such a loved and respected head is then kept from the fleet and replaced by those who displease the men. Now it is shown what calamity and disaster this brings with it. The same evening of the 12th the States General learned of the defeat, they sent a letter to both Trump and Johann Evertsen, asking them to return. The English believed that the Dutch had been all but defeated, and sent 20 ships away to the Mediterranean, a mistake that led to a defeat at the Battle of Dungeness but didn't prevent the defeat of the not yet reinforced English Mediterranean fleet of the Battle of Leghorn. In the former battle the Dutch were led again by Trump, Derwith had suffered a mental breakdown and would be officially replaced as supreme commander. In May 1653, ship lists. No complete lists exist and especially the order of battle of the English fleet is poorly known. The Dutch list differs in detail from particular lists of ships from late September 1652 from Witt Derwith's journal and other archival sources. Known ships include, England Sovereign 106, Resolution 88, James Chapter 66, Triumph 60, Vanguard 58, Andrew 56, Speaker 54, Lion 50, Converter 44, Garland 44, Advice 42, Diamond 42, Foresight 42, Pelican 42, Ruby 42, Assistance 40, Assurance 40, Dragon 40, London 40, Nonsuch 40, President 40, Richard and Martha 40, Portsmouth 38, Anthony Bonaventure 36, Hound 36, Guinea 34, Hercules 34, Lisbon Merchant 34, Convert 32, Mary 32, Exchange 30, Cullen 28, Prudent Mary 28, Advantage 26, Falmouth 26, Samson 26, Martha 25, Golden Dove 24, Old Warwick 24, Pearl 24, Acorn 22, Signet 22, Little President 22, Nightingale 22, Gift 16+, plus, Paradox 12, Renown 10,